Hey guys, Mike Roberts, the Converse Cowboy Podcast. Sat down today with Joey Jemison over in Weatherford, Texas. He's a high-end leather maker, saddle maker, makes chaps for folks in the performance horse world. Really just had a conversation about his journey and all the challenges along the way. You know, it's pretty cool. He's got a sign in his shop now that he, he keeps there um, from the one of the first times he started to go out on his own and went belly up and lost everything he had. But he keeps that there as a reminder to not ever want to go back to that place, you know? And I think that's very interesting and very humble to keep that there as a reminder, you know, and to acknowledge that things in life, uh, they don't always go as planned and to overcome those hurdles and challenges. And that's some of the stuff we talk about today, overcoming challenges and hurdles and having the right mindset to just keep keep plunging float forward. So y'all check it out and let us know what you think. Hey guys, this is Mike Roberts, another episode of The Converse Cowboy, sitting here with Joey Jemison in Weatherford, Texas, high-end leather and saddle maker, and uh, we're just going to have a conversation about how and why he's been able to do what he's doing for such a long time, and um, Joey, I know you've been here, and correct me if any of my facts are wrong, but you've been in this location since about 1995? Yeah. Can we go back before then? Let's go back to the early days when you got into this this trade and and kind of your mindset and and some of the mentors that that led you on your path i know you started in the stockyards is that right yeah i grew up in the on the north side of fort worth and closer on the north side of fort worth and uh, uh when i was a junior in high school i was in a work program and uh i had to go find a job as part of it and so i thought i was pretty smart in uh, going down the stockyards because I was wanting a pair of shaps and I thought if I went to work from this one saddle shop that they had a guy there making the kind of shaps I wanted and uh, I thought either I'd get a, get a, a deal on a pair or maybe learn how to make them myself and that's kind of how it got started I guess. I got you so um, you were doing some bronc riding at the time is that right? Yeah I, I high school rodeoed and stuff like that I never I, I, I did, uh, back in those days, it was the RCA, and I had my permit. I never filled my permit. I I got to thinking at one point that, uh, you know, I, was, I needed to get serious about doing something, uh, and, you know, I didn't, I didn't really see myself getting rich rodeoing, and so I thought, well, I better get serious about something. That's when I got kind of serious about the leather business. Right. So where where exactly did you start out at? What, what I started shop out, was it? Uh, in what is today's uh, Letty's parking lot, it 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 was L White Boot and Saddlery. Mm -hmm. uh, they used to build all the old Madison Square Garden saddles, and uh, had been in Fort Worth. I don't I don't know how how long they were they were there uh, prior to Letty's or anything else. I mean they've been there for a long time. And when I went to work there, <clears throat> Miss White. I think she was uh, the last, you know, it was it was actually, his, it was Lewis White, and then Louis White Jr. was her husband, and he had a brother, and everybody was gone. I think they had some relatives, but nobody in Fort Worth, and she was like in her, she was 75 or in her 70s, and a year after I, I left there, uh, she sold everything. And I think uh, Letty's wound up buying the building. And at first they leased it out and another saddle shop came in there and they figured out that wasn't too smart. And so uh, they tore the building down and made a parking lot out of it. And so anyway, and that's, I think that's one way, one way they got the other guy out was cause they, they were gonna make a parking lot out of it. But, I gotcha. Yeah. So, <clears throat> I'm not sure if it was at that shop. I know you you um, you worked at several different shops um, in, in your early days. Where um, I, you were volunteering, right, at some point for three well, or four days a week, just to get I, some knowledge. I, yeah, when I first went to L. Watts, uh, like I said, I was 16 years old. I was a junior in high school. Uh, 
she hired me. There had been a, which it was a, called a DE program, uh, distributive education. It was a on-the-job training program. And L. Whites had had a DE student there before, and I, I think she kind of hired me to do the same thing that one had done, which that was that guy was on the sales floor. Mm -hmm. Well, I was kind of a shy, bashful kid, and I'm still not much of a salesman. But anyway, uh, when I first got there and she hired me to work, it was half a day, uh, half a day Thursday, half a day Friday, and all day Saturday. And uh, I knew that if I didn't have anything to do Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, that my mother would work me to death at home. <laughs> and so I'd much rather be doing something I enjoyed than home doing whatever, you know, probably be scrubbing the sidewalks out front, you know, or something. Yeah. Anyway, so I asked Miss White if she'd let me come in, and I knew they had a saddle shop upstairs, and I said, if I could come in and, and you know, it wouldn't cost her nothing. I'd work Monday through Wednesday. So I was really working, you know, it was half a days, but I was working, you know, six half a days or five half a days and all day Saturday. And uh, anyway, I did that for my junior year. And then that, as right before school was out, that my, my junior year, I went down down the street to Ryan's. I, I was wanting to get a new straw hat. And L. White's was a little antiquated. And they didn't have anything that a 16-year-old, you know, kid wanted. And so I went down to Ryan's, and, and uh, while I was in there, uh, there was a guy in there. It was Doug Lesh, uh, who uh, he's passed away. But anyway, he was kind of on the sales floor. He knew I worked at Elwhite's, and he kind of got to talking to me and said, how'd you like to come to work here? And he kind of set the deal up, and I talked to Wendy and Wendy hired me. Wendy, Wendy Ryan? Yeah, Wendy Ryan. <clears throat> and uh, I went to work there, and he, he said, well, when can you start? And I said, well, I'm in a, this DE program. If I quit my job or I lose my job before the school year's out, I lose credit for the whole year. And he said, when's school out? And I said, well, it's in about three weeks. And so, sure enough, three weeks later, I went, I went to work at, at Ryan's. And, and I, I mean... The thing I was excited about really was the fact that I would get paid not only because it was summertime, I'd get paid all day long, but I got paid for every day I worked. And so, yeah. And, uh, Which was how much at that time? I, when I started out, it was $1.25 an hour was minimum wage. Mm. And then. Big money. Big money. <laughs> and then uh, Wendy had told me that if I, if I lasted or. If I did good in, I don't remember now, if it was three months, six months, I'm like, hey, give me a raise. So I kind of forgot about that, and he called me down to his office one day, or I came back from lunch, and the foreman up there told me that Wendy wanted to see me. And I thought he was going to fire me. And I went in there, and, and uh, he, he gave me a nickel hour raise. And so I was up to $1.30 at that point, and uh, yeah. still, still had a job. So Yeah. Anyway, and, and I, I worked at Ryan's until, I think it was, uh, it was sometime in 74 when I went to work for, I don't know if you remember, uh, there was a guy named Cajun, it's Cajun Saddlery, and they were pretty hot in the, in the he, which he'd worked at Ryan, Cajun had worked at Ryan's when I first went to work there, and then he went out on his own, and he pretty much predominantly built cutting saddles. Okay. And that was when the the flat seated saddles were just starting to take off, and uh, he, I mean, back in those days, they they couldn't have got any flatter. I mean, they were board flat. Anyway, he he was uh, pretty hot at that point, and uh, he kind of got his start too from another saddle maker that was pretty hot at that time. This guy named Daryl Tidwell. Mm. And I worked for Cajun for a while, and then he was hard to work for, and I, I wound up, I went to work for uh, Daryl Tidwell. And he's out in Monument, New Mexico. And I just, I think I just turned 21. No, I don't think I was 21 yet. I think I was still 20 when I went to work out there. But the drinking age in, 
in Texas was 18 at that time, and, and in New Mexico it was still 21. But I turned 20 out there, and I worked out there for a whole week. Uh, it, was, it was one of them deals that just uh, – most frustrating time in my life trying to trying to build saddles you know the why is that well why was that it was i was i was in a little bitty room by myself pretty much had a bench had a little screw in light bulb that i mean i'm that's about how high it was i mean standing up it wasn't very high and the back door had a crack about this much at the bottom then tapered down and up on the other end and the opposite on the other and there was a a big sand arena out back and so sand kind of blew in underneath the door and it was everything I mean that, of course I wouldn't there's no humidity out there and I would wet a piece of leather and I'd lay it over here and I'd turn around and do something and at that time I'd been building saddles for a pretty good while you know a couple of years at least and I thought I was fairly proficient at it anyway and I'd turn around and do something else so I'd turn around and that leather would be dry and so I'd have to wet it again. It just, you know, just so many different variables in there. And then when I did wet something and I go to cut it, or even if, if, it, if it had been wet, it was like it had sand in the center of it. Mm. You know, you could just hear your knife crackle when you went through it. And like I said, it, it was just, I was ready to quit every evening. <laughs> and then uh, I'd work late, and Daryl was, Dar and Daryl was a pretty unique guy. And uh, I kept telling myself, you know, you can learn a lot from this guy. So I stayed, and the next morning by lunchtime, I was ready to quit again. And I finally got through that, that first week, and I built a saddle. And I remember he said, well, you want me to cut you out another one? And I said, no, nah, I think I'm just going to go on home. Yeah. I'm going to go back to Fort Worth. And he said, well, let me pay you. And I said, no, nah, you don't owe me nothing. <laughs> I just want to go home. So, <laughs> it was so like I, went that, back, huh? I went and I went back to work for Cajun, and he was still hard to work for. And I wound up by the end of that year, you know, it was two or three months later, uh, I quit and went to, went back to work at Ryan's. And then I was there for uh, a little while, and then I wound up moving to Stephenville and going to work for Calvin Allen. Who Calvin had worked at Cajuns and at Ryan's, where I was, and he would just open in his shop. And then Stephenville, I built the first saddle that went out of his shop. And then, oh, I don't know, within a year or so, I wound up uh, moving up to Graham, and there was another guy that I'd worked at, at Cajuns and Ryan's with, a guy named Daryl Long, and uh, he was kind of given an interest in the saddle shop up there from one of the owners, which was uh, Delwyn Birch, who used to used to show cutting horses. Actually, Delwyn owned uh, Doc's Mahogany, which was uh, the horse was at Royal Mahogany that uh, was at Kathy Dawn won the fraternity okay. on. And uh, anyway, uh, I was up there for a couple years, and I got married up, up while I was up there, and. Uh, and then I'm right, right before my son was born. I moved to back to Fort Worth and went to work at Letty's. And then uh, that was the first time I worked for Letty's. I worked in some of the places a couple times. Anyway, uh, I went back to work at Letty's. No, I, I stayed at Letty's, and then I went out on my own in 1981, and I moved to Byers, Texas. And I started my first shop. I think I was 26 years old, and was doing real good. Uh, but it was also the, there in the early 80s is when the Texas economy kind of went to hell, mm -hmm. uh, the oil oil business and everything. So, and the cutting horse business was very reliant on the oil business, and so I kind of went broke, and I went back to work for Letty's. And I stayed there until 89, and then I went out on my own again. And, uh, and how old were you at that point? Uh, in 89, I'd have been in my 30s, I think. Okay. Yeah, 30, early, like 30, 
four, something like that. Anyway, um, yeah, and then and then uh, I had my shop in in first. I had my shop in my my garage in Fort Worth that was uh, underneath. I was living in a garage apartment behind my parents' house, and I had my shop there. And then I had I got some guys to come to work for me, and I I leased a building down on North Main, right up the steep street from Letty's and Ryan's. And I had my shop there until um, well ninety ninety five when I moved it out here. I've been out here ever since. Got you. It's an interesting ride. Yeah, an interesting ride. Tell me this because at sixteen, man, I didn't know what the hell I want to do. Still today I, I don't know what i want to be when i grow up how how did you know that that was the path you wanted to go down you know i, I really don't know I, I enjoyed doing it and i guess a lot of things it seemed like something i you know i i kind of figured out and and uh not completely i'm still trying to figure it out but but you know i could see where you know it was enjoyable to accomplish something by finishing it mm -hmm. you know just like i have a a uh, friend of mine who is a uh, he's a lobbyist makes a lot of money and he got started doing leather work and he loves it absolutely loves it has bought bought machinery and tools stuff like that and i was talking to him one time about it and he said you know in my job he said i can i can walk over you know on friday and, and flip the switch off and look back at my desk and I can't see that I got anything done that week. And he said, but I can go home. And he said, I can make a pair of spur straps or I can make a head stall. I can do, make something. When I get through, I can look at it and say, you know, I made this. And he yeah. said, I may give it away to somebody, but, you know, I made that. And uh, it's kind of that way. There's, there's a certain enjoyment in getting to where, you, you know, you feel like you're, you're proficient in doing whatever it is you're doing, whether it's tooling or or building a saddle, or building shafts, or mm -hmm. or whatever. And it's, there's a lot of frustration. There's there's a lot of obstacles. I mean, my whole theory on life is is uh, life is nothing but overcoming obstacles. Because you know, I may be doing something in the shop, and it's something that I've done thousands of times, but some new variable pops in there. And so, you know, the truth the truth of the matter is, with with what I do or anything you do in life. You know, you don't have to do it the same way every time. Mm -hmm. And and when there is a new obstacle, new variable in there, you got to figure out to get the end result that you're at going after. But you may have to come come at it from a different direction. And so, yeah. that's that's basically what I do. Yeah, and I've heard you say that before, and that's definitely something I want to get to. You know, how you've been able to stay progressive in this industry and and be able to pivot and change. And um, you know, I think sometimes folks may get set in their ways. Um, was you know starting out was money ever a concern you know a lot of times people would choose a career path based on how much money they make they may they may hate it they may be miserable you know yeah. but was I, that ever a concern you, early on you know i guess it never was because i never made much money so <laughs> so you know but i yeah. you know look, look at the good time i was having you know that was yeah that was really part of you know i, I enjoyed doing it i was able to I think get by on 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 it, but yeah, later on, you know, just like anything else, you wanna you wanna do better, and, mm -hmm. and you know, you got to be just like anything else, you got to be smart about it to do to make to make money. It's a it's true in anything you do. Um, you know, my deal. I mean, uh, starting my own deal this time. Uh, like I said, I went broke the first time I did it, and I did that on borrowed money. And then the second time, uh, when I started it this time, my parents gave me uh, $15,000. And I had that money, and I was building saddles, and I had orders and stuff like that. And I was sitting there thinking one day, you know, I could buy some leather, and I could buy some trees. I've got the money to do it. And if I had that stuff, if I could get somebody else to build some saddles or do some stuff for me, you know, it's better than that leather of those trees sitting over there, you know, several months before I get around to doing it. And so that's kind of how I got started doing it. But also, 
I think one reason my deal has worked, and I think any business is, is the same thing, is you got to keep putting so much back into it. You can't just because you sell one, ever whatever it is, that money don't go in your pocket. It's got to, mm-hmm. it's got to keep. You got to feed the beast, and and uh, you know that's basically you know what what we've done. We've never really lived that high. But the money that we do make goes back in and in into the business. Uh, you know, I'm kind of a uh, a tool nut. I mean, I I enjoy what I do, but I also enjoy the the craft and 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 uh, I I buy a lot of tools. I mean, I have a lot of friends that kid me about it because I I'm pretty stupid about it sometimes. I just if it's something I want, I I get it. If it's something, mm-hmm. you know, and I buy a lot of tools that are uh in today's world are collector's items but i don't buy them to collect i buy them to use Mm -hmm. and a lot of the tools i use are 100 plus years old and uh they're really the better tools and there there's there's some people out there that uh refurbish tools and they can they can take some of those tools that are 100 years old and when they get through with them they're better than what you can what you can buy today, you know, modern day stuff. The stu- the the uh, steel in them is better. It'll stay sharper and so on and so forth. And but they're also expensive. You know, everything it's kind of it's kind of like buying a collector's item in a way. And same thing. I mean, I like tools and I like machinery. I like you know I like things that what we do is handmade. But there's some machines that can do a more precise job than you can by hand Mm. and that's that's what i'm interested in doing is you know being as precise or or whatever as you can be and and leather is a kind of a a funny medium i guess you'd say um it's forgiving in some ways and other ways it's not and so you kind of have to learn you know what you can get away with and what you can't yeah And, and like i said uh machinery and uh, you know a nice tool makes the job easier to do it makes it easier to do it uh, consistently and that's and that's what it's all about yeah so. yeah that's interesting um tell me was there ever a time that you were thinking to yourself man what am i doing like is this really the road i need to go down or did well, you ever question that or were you just confident and knew that no, this is what I, you were going to do i mean uh it's couple things there really i heard a deal one time uh about a guy that used to take and he was kind of like a specialty act and and it might be a a demolition derby or something and they he'd get in the casket and they'd put a stick of dynamite in there and you know and the deal i saw he didn't even tell you well what's going to happen is it's going to blow the casket's going to blow up and i'm going to come rolling out the side of it and he said i'll be passed out when i do it and he said i'll get over here and, and it'll take a few minutes to then wake me up and i mean sure enough i, I saw this deal on tv one time and, and and they blew up this casket and this guy he rolls out across the ground and then these people run out there and they've got a fire extinguisher put him out and everything and uh he wakes up he's passed out and they somebody asked him say why in the hell do you do that and he said, well, he said, I guess I'm too lazy to work and too nervous to steal, so this, <laughs> this is what I do. But uh, that's kind of the way I, I joke around about this. And, and as far as, you know, what you're saying, do I think I'm on the wrong path somewhere or have I thought, you know, just like anything else you do and you do repetitiously, you get burnt out. And I've been burnt out, you know. It's kind of like... Uh, Oh, different times, like I said, I was burnt out, and and uh, just you just don't even want to look at it. You know, you can't concentrate on it and everything. And what gets me, what I figured out that gets me back, I guess, inspired to do it, and kind of you know, kind of curbs the burnout. Is there again my tools? You know, um, that's why I don't have a problem spending money on tools because. You know, if I've got, if I go somewhere and there's leather shows I go to and I may buy a lot of tools or 
find, and I'm always looking for something I don't have, but something different or something, mm-hmm. something old, something that does something unique. And, uh, of course, when you buy it, you can't wait to get home and, and use it. And so it's the same thing with machinery and tools, stuff like that. And I think that's really what I attribute to keeping me from getting burnt out. Mm. And, and, yeah, you still question, I mean, uh, if, you pro- if you chose the right deal. You know, because it, you don't get rich in, in the saddle business. I mean, and actually the saddle business itself is, is uh, very competitive. You're dealing with a very labor-intensive product that also has a lot of material cost and so on and so forth. And, you know, uh, the people that do them in volume, that's the only way they can really make money. But then again, to do them in volume, they've cut a lot of corners, and that's something that I don't have that in me. sacrifice quality, you think? Yeah. 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 Um. Walk me through a day today, you know, like, um, and what I mean today, like currently, what does a day look like for you? And I know it changes because you're going to shows or you may be in the mm-hmm. shop, but if you're in the shop, what is, what does a typical day look like for you? Well, the truth matter is, and it's something that I want to kind of work on, but I'm, I'm the hub of the wheel here and I've got, like right now, it's just me and my wife. And then I've got uh, Jesse, another boy, and he's, he's been working for me since 2000 and, uh, oh, on an average day, what happens is everything kind of starts with me. Like I, I cut everything. Like if we're going to make head stalls or we're going to make belts or we're going to do whatever, I cut it, and then I, get, you know, I, I can get it to a certain point, and it either goes to Jesse or or my wife. And of course, she does a lot of stuff. She has a laser engraver, and she does a lot of stuff that I can't even start to do but but then again she does stuff for me too on that laser so there's sometimes when you know i've got to cut stuff to keep her busy and a lot of times i may i may cut out shaps and and i've got a bunch of shaps cut out and and she'll start on them and jesse sometimes helps her if jesse's not doing something else i got him to do but anyway uh, it's just a like i said it's a never-ending cycle of you you have to kind of look and see what your inventory looks like and whether it's belts or head stalls or breast collars or shaps or spur straps you know of course shaps are they're order deal and so are saddles and so you always kind of keep them in the mix and you know and you don't ever get caught up on either one of them but uh oh the the spur straps or the belts or something like that you got to fill in the you know the blanks when you sell sell something, but hopefully you know I try to get my inventory built up enough to where I can sell a little bit of it before I have to go back and replenish, and uh, and that same thing with the belts. But that's always something you're just kind of keep keep restocking the shelves. How many hours a day do you think you're here in the shop? Oh, probably average ten, you know, maybe more some days. Yeah, I I, I used to be. Uh, more of a night person than I am now. And I used to work a lot of nights and there was a lot of times uh, I worked all night. And I kinda, after I got a little older, I kinda decided I need to quit doing that. And uh, so I don't I don't put in the hours, you know, all nighters like I used to. And I don't, I don't, you know, if something has to go out, yes, I, I'm here till it's done, you know, but, but, uh, uh, I try not to get in those situations too often. Yeah. Are you listening to music? I'm curious. Do you listen to music whenever you're working or podcast or? Yeah. I'll listen, I'll listen to radio. I like I like some kind of noise in the background. I just got a new set of hearing aids. Okay. And uh, I, I, I've always been bad. I mean, I, I'm, I'm deaf. And I mean, I'm not totally deaf, but I'm tone deaf in some, some areas. And I mean, I may hear you talking but I can't understand what you're saying. And I, like I said, I've, I've got, just got the new pair. This is the, the third pair I've had. And these actually, uh, they hook up to my cell phone and I can listen to podcasts on them, but also I can talk on the phone on them, 
Whereas I, before I was always you know, just talking on the phone, I couldn't hear. Uh, and I mean, there's there's times when I really felt bad the customer would call and they'd, they'd have to repeat themselves three or four times. And, you know, I, I could not understand what they were saying. I'd finally say, here, let me let you talk to my wife. <laughs> and uh, like I said, now I've got, and I used to always try to get everybody because I thought I heard better on my landline than I did my cell phone. Yeah. Well, now with the cell phone going directly to my hearing aids, I hear better on my cell phone. So I'm trying to get everybody to call me on my cell phone now because I can hear it, hear, on, hear them better on that than I can the, the landline. Matter of fact, the landline, now I have to pull the, pull the hearing aid out and hold the phone up next to it to even hear it. Yeah. <laughs> it's when I first got it, people would call and I'd, I'd put it up there and I'd, I could not hear. I mean, you could, it's like they were miles away kind of talking to you. You couldn't hear them. Yeah. And so, anyway, that's, that's uh, what I do now. Is I, a lot of times I listen to podcasts or, or whatever. On, on I, I may have the radio going, but I listen to podcasts. Yeah, I know we were just talking about Andrea Fapani before we started mm-hmm. recording. Um, what other ones are you listening to? <laughs> I listen to a lot of Fox. So. <laughs> Fox? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, I listen to, you know, a lot of different Fox. There's, and there's some other, there's some, uh, my wife got me started on this too. Uh, what's it called? Uh, you can listen to books. Yeah. And Audible? Audible. And, yes, sir. And, uh listen to a lot of books there's a lot of the podcasts or some of them that are you know how i built this and it talks about a lot of businesses you know how they got started and and you know some some of and my wife listens to a lot of them too and we kind of compare notes sometimes she says oh you gotta listen to this one you know and i listened to the one about the 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 it was two brothers that made the t-shirt that says life is good and it's pretty interesting podcast. I mean, they they're now they're a multi million dollar company. Really? Yeah. But uh, when they first started out, they were they were just you know hand to mouth, and yeah. it, it's really pretty interesting. And then, and she was she was telling me about some that she she listened to, but the the ones about you know podcasts about people that went out and and started a business, and you know what they went through to get to where they were. And of course, most of those people that you listen to, they're already in the multi-million dollar range. I mean, mm-hmm. and just like she was, she was talking. She listened to one about the people that uh, started uh, what is it, Chicken Salad Chick. Mm-hmm. And uh, anyway, she talked about how you know they could just barely scrape by, and they get a deal in the mail that they you know said you, you know, what is it. Uh, might be fifty thousand dollars you know and loan and everything they'd they'd take it out and and then they got got further and further behind on stuff then they had an investor come in and the first investor kind of wasn't working and so they were trying to get out of that deal and and they had to buy him out for three times what he gave them and they got another guy to come in and help them and then finally they finally got it to where it was working and they sold it for like uh, $250,000. But they had gone through all this stuff that anybody else would have quit, right? you know, before they finally got to the point where they they made a profit or, or sold it and were able to retire, enjoy life or whatever. Yeah, that's interesting. I think we can learn from, I think we can learn from, even if it's not, you yeah. know, in your case, leather related, we can learn from anything, oh, yeah. you know, when, and, when it and comes and to- I, I love history, I mean, and, and I haven't really found any. I haven't looked that hard, but I I, I need I need to find some stuff because I do. I, I like to hear about a lot of different stuff that I'm curious about mm-hmm. history wise and and what have you. And, and uh, you know, there's a lot of history that you may have been taught this in school, but this is what really happened. And and uh, I like that kind of stuff too. Yeah, you mentioned listening to, to those folks about business. Um, you could be the best leather maker in the world, but if, if you don't know how to run a business, you're probably not going to make it. How, how, what influenced you, or how did you learn the business side of what you do? Well, I mean, I'm still learning it, to be honest. And, uh, you know, for a long, long time, I was always under the impression that you build a better mousetrap, 
and the world will be the path to your door. And my, me and my wife went to a, a clinic, I guess you'd say, a business clinic. And I'll never forget this guy was standing up there, and he was like a CPA bookkeeper or whatever, and he put on these clinics and what have you. And he had a chalkboard, and he had, he had marketing, finance, production. And he said, which one of those were sitting out of... In a, in a group of people, and he said, which one of those <clears throat> is the most important thing to your business? And I'm sitting there thinking, well, it's production. You know, you got to make it, and you make a good one, and, you know, people will beat a path to your door. So I'm thinking, and I, and I say, production. He said, no. <coughs> it's marketing. He said, what's the second most important thing? And I think, well, you know, if you market it, you got to produce it. You got to, you know, he said, no, it's your finance. He said, production is the least important thing. Hmm. And he said, he said, I don't care. He said, you can build a superior product and be out-marketed by an inferior product. And he said, that inferior, the guy with the inferior product is going to make way more money than you and yada, 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 even though your product is 10 times better. And so he said, if you can mark, you know, make a better product and market it, you know, pr properly, you're going to do okay. But if, if, if you don't have your marketing, an inferior product is going to wipe you out every time. Mm -hmm. And I never, never saw that. And then, like I said, now I, I see that and we have tried to, we're, we're trying to change our marketing and a lot of things that we do. Uh, we still want to, I still want to build a good product. Of yeah, course, for sure. But, but, but you uh, have done a very good job branding. I mean, Joey Jimison is a, no. Nice whole name, and and you've done a very good job. I know for so I I I've got a pair of chaps from you. What about a year, maybe yeah. two years ago, something like that. And um, I I got them in, and and I came out here, and you talked walked me through the whole process, um, which I'm very grateful for. You didn't have to do that, but you took the time and yeah. walked me through your process and measured me out, and I got them in, and they didn't fit just right, like. I think it was through the thigh and you just asked two or three questions and you knew exactly what was wrong and you're like send them back and I very hesitantly send them back because I didn't you know I'm like I got these things here you know I want to wear them but I got them back you know I sent them off and they came back a week or so later I don't remember how long but um and they fit perfect I mean I couldn't have asked for a better pair so definitely the quality is there and um what is it I guess my question around that is um are chaps probably your your more favorite thing to to make? Uh, yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, used to my business revolved around saddles. I mean, mm -hmm. that was what my mindset was. And I've seen a lot of guys, and I mean, I've seen guys that were successful at building a lot of you know smaller items, but they wanted to be a saddle maker. I mean, they just it just eating them up that they. They couldn't call themselves saddle maker, and I, to be honest with you, I probably is that way too. But uh, the truth of the matter is, saddles, like I said, they're the least profitable thing that that we build. Yeah. And I've always known that all this, you know, the the shaps, the head stalls, the spur shaps, the belts, all that stuff is is way more profitable. It's, you know. There again, you can do it in a shorter period of time. You can build, you know, just like the shaps or, or head stalls or anything like that. Uh, you don't have the, you know, the big material cost in, it, in each one of them that you have in a saddle, so on and so forth. But everybody still wants to be the saddle maker. They want to, they want to be, I guess the saddle maker is the top of the heap. And, you know, everybody wants to do that. Uh, and I still do too. I I don't. I'm not going to quit building saddles mm -hmm. uh, anytime soon that I know of. But uh, I still now I concentrate in yeah shaps. And you know that there again. Uh, when I started doing a lot of this small stuff, which we'd always done it, but it was it was only taken to you know a certain level, and that was good enough, I guess you'd say. And then. Uh, and I tell people all the time too that I guess one reason I got into doing uh, the smaller items and 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 I guess I it it, it there again it was kind of one of them like a new game to play you know mm -hmm. that, that, you know that I'm still going to the same place to go to work 
but I got new things to do, and it was it was figuring out how to how to do this or how to make mine different than anybody else's and what have you, whether it was a head stall or a spur strap or a belt or shaps, whatever it was. And I've a lot of it, I mean, a lot of the design or whatever you want to call it, it just came to me. I don't know, really know, you know, like a lot of the two-tone stuff, which I guess I'm getting to be known for, right. uh, is actually something that I stole from... Uh, up north in Sheridan, they uh, Don King did a lot of two tone. He used to do the NFR saddles, and that was all two tone stuff. And the two tone, whether it was belts or spur straps or head stalls or whatever, you know, all kind of came out of that. Uh, and it, I always thought it was a good look. And and the truth of the matter is, I don't know that it's that. I mean, up there you see it fairly regular, mm -hmm. but down here it wasn't. It was a new. You know, like I'm, like I'm the guy that invented, it and I didn't. You know, <laughs> and uh, anyway, I, I like the looks of it, and and we we've incorporated that into just about everything we do. And uh, like I said, in there again, you know, doing some of this uh, stuff, it's not that saddles are monotonous because they're really not. There's no two of them alike, and like I said, each one of them is a new obstacle to overcome. Mm -hmm. But there's something about, you know, designing a new whatever it is, you know, whether it be there again, a head stall or a breast collar or, or whatever, and sitting down and, and kind of have an ideal for something and then, you know, maybe take it a step or, or two above that, you know, and, and uh, that there again is is uh, the challenge or the excitement that keeps some of that burn burnout away too. Yeah. You know? So tell me how because you're a very uh, very very humble guy how do you keep your ego quiet because we all have egos we all want to do good like you were talking about folks wanting to build saddles how do you remain very humble after being you know as successful as you are i didn't know it was but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um i don't know i mean i don't i don't I don't think of myself as being any better than anybody else, you know, mm -hmm. for one thing. You know, I, I think, you know, uh, I don't consider myself the best <clears throat> at anything, really. But I also think that, you know, I'll, pu I'll put mine up beside anybody else's. So, you know, there's, there's guys out there that I really admire as far as what they can do and what have you. <clears throat> Can you name but, name a couple of those guys? Well, Don King was was probably you know one of my biggest heroes. You know, when I was a kid, there was George Murray uh, was was one of the uh, old saddle makers around here that everybody had had such a reputation. Uh, I mean, that, there again, a lot of guys up in Sheridan and that Sheridan area, you know, blow me away with what they can do. I mean, there's there's guys up there that tool. Uh, like Don Butler, who he's passed away. There's a guy, uh, uh, lost his name for a second. Um, <laughs> can't believe I forgot his name. But anyway, uh, there's there's some guys up there that, you know, and, and tooling is something that <clears throat> uh, I don't really think of myself as being the best tooler. I tool good enough to please myself. <coughs> um, don't mean to cough into that, but anyway, no, uh, <coughs> you know, and that's because I remember early. I mean, I would do some stuff that when I tooled it, and it'd make me want to throw up when I got through with it. <coughs> and so it was just a process of of there again. The obstacle was trying to get it to where it looked presentable, mm -hmm. and so. You know, I've, I've, I think I've got my my tooling and stuff down to where it's my style and it's it looks pleasing to me. So mm -hmm. that's who I'm really trying to please on most of this stuff is me. Yeah, but, I got you. What, um, <coughs> you know, I, I listen to Joe Rogan's podcast. I don't know yeah. if you've heard of him, but he talks about having pluses, minuses, and equals. And so that's somebody to look up to, somebody to learn from your peers, you know, folks that are doing the same thing as you, and then also people to teach. 
Are you doing any of that? Um, and if so, who is the next person to look out for? Like who may be an up and coming saddle maker, leather maker in the, in the industry, in the industry? You know, there's a lot of, a lot of guys out there that I think are doing some really nice stuff. I mean, um, as far as any one of them that you've had an influence on, is there anybody that you're specifically teaching or folks that maybe have reached out to you for advice? You know, I don't, I don't, I mean, I can't say that I've, I've, you know, I've, I've trained a lot of my own competition over the years, but, uh, um, you know, I don't see anybody really just blowing the doors off, you know, uh, either. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's another thing is I, I get a lot of, a lot of calls. You can call it teaching or whatever. I mean, I've, I've been doing this a long time. I've seen a lot of stuff, uh, I've seen the right ways to do things and the wrong ways to do stuff, you know, and, and uh, uh, you know, I'm I'm still learning, to be honest with you. I, I, I learn from some, you know, rank amateurs sometimes because they, they'll, they'll do something that's looking at it from a different perspective and pick up a tool, hold it backwards and, and mm-hmm. make it work. And you sit there and you think, hey, that, that's not a bad idea, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh I'm trying to think, you know, like I said, and I get, I get calls from guys all the time that are, you know, they've, they've run into a wall and they, they say, well, what would you do? Or have you got any suggestions on whatever it is or whatever? And, uh, so I'm always getting, getting those kind of calls. Um, and as far as, uh, I really haven't had an, an, uh, an apprentice, uh, that you know was i've had people work for me that i've taught them and some of them gone out on their own and and done well uh but i haven't had anybody that here lately anyway that i've apprenticed or whatever uh you know to me it's a lot easier a lot of for some of these younger guys now than it was when i was starting because one thing is the internet again Mm -hmm. you can look up stuff all over the country different people all over the country you can see their stuff you can blow it up you can copy it off you can trace it off you can do whatever you know and and i think a lot of people have developed uh their skills a lot quicker because of that Mm -hmm. you know because you know in my you know when i was coming up yeah you might if i worked in a shop that had three or four five guys you you might learn something from every one of them or learn a little bit and you know in most cases back in those days i was always a kid in the shop and uh, they were a little more willing to show me than they would some of the others but but uh was it just trial and error though yeah a lot of it's trial and error and you know everything everything in the leather business and it's pretty true in life too it's all common sense you know and it it's it's what I see and what I do too is you gotta have you gotta it don't matter what you're doing you gotta know where you want to get to and then and then your job is to figure out how mm-hmm. you know it, it doesn't matter if you're you know and I've my wife used to train horses I've I've known horse trainers all my life and you can sit there and talk to one of them and they'll talk about you know training a horse well what I do is a lot like training a horse you know you may have your method of doing it. But then something comes along that your method ain't working, and so right. you got to reach in your bag of tricks and pull out something that does. And it's you know there again, same thing with training a horse, trying to do any you know do anything. It there again, it's uh, it's overcoming obstacles, and uh, that's really and and, it, and that's kind of what what makes it interesting too. Mm-hmm. You know, is is uh, sometimes you don't look for that major <clears throat> pain. pain to overcome but you know when you get through you kind of you know it was it was a challenge and you had to meet that challenge yeah and so uh like i said that's that's really what we do is it's it's all common sense it's just you know it, if it, something don't work you got to try something else you know that's right so. yeah and, and that's so true you know overcoming <clears throat> obstacles and 
it's all in how we perceive those obstacles. You know, at that moment, we may not understand why that's happening. But yeah. if we were able to fast forward time and look back, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes and, sense. And now sometimes you get past it and you look back and you see, well, duh, you know, you, you missed it. And, yeah. and uh, <laughs> you know, you went about it the hard way. Yeah. And, and uh, like I said, it's it's all a learning experience. I mean, that's right. Everything uh, in life is a learning experience, so. If you could, kind of along those same lines, if you could go back in time and give your 20-year-old self advice about life, about leather making, what advice would that be? Uh, I don't know. Might be run, force, run. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Oh, stay away from girls. I don't don't know what I would tell myself, you know. for the most part, you know, ever since I was there again in my twenties, I've always kind of been heading in the in the same direction. I have never gone way over here and then decided, oh well, I need to be over here. You know, I've always kind of been going in the same direction. I don't know if it's still don't know if that's the right direction, but that's you know where I'm at right now is I, I've been kind of steadily heading in this direction mm-hmm. and. Am I where I want to be? No, not really. But, you know, I'm closer than I was. But I, th- I don't think we ever get no, to where we want to so. be, you know, you know, and that's okay. No, it's kind of like, you know, like in the leather business, whether it's saddle orders or chap orders, you don't ever want to be caught up, you know. Right. That means you got nothing to do, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, you you always want to – It's not it's not always good to be – so far behind you can't see daylight right that's not a good situation either but you don't ever want to be one or two away from being caught up yeah. either so you know you got you want people to want your stuff enough to where you you always stay busy so right um so you've been through ups and downs and challenges and um i'm curious to know from everybody that i sit down with what is your why like what is the purpose behind what kept you going through those hard times and why you still do what you do today with such passion? Well, I enjoy doing it, I guess it's part of it. And I guess the other part is I like to eat and so it keeps you working. So, you know, and and I have been broke and and I think that there's a, it's not a bad thing. I, you kind of learn from that too. Mm-hmm. And I think, uh, you know, it makes you appreciate things more and it also makes you not ever ever want to go back there and so you know it may give you some determination so um and and you know and there's nothing worse than being broke it is a gut-wrenching i mean i remember to this day matter of fact that sign up there uh, that was that was when when my shop was in buyers and Mm. and, uh, uh it's it's a humiliating frustrating gut-wrenching thing to go through and uh um like i said it's it's somewhere you don't ever want to go back to yeah and so you know you'll you'll stay up extra hours you'll do a lot of things and you know even even in those days up there you know it happened and it didn't matter how many hours you put in it didn't matter what you did it wasn't going to change the outcome back then you know and so uh but it also makes you makes you try now because you don't want to be back there so yeah yeah that's exactly right talk about um you follow del brisby at all no del brisby you oh you need to check him out he's a funny cat is he in, funny? The, in the western world yeah he's a comedian but anyway he somewhat coined the phrase booth life and so he'll go to different shows and whatnot and um can you talk about what that's like you know not you spend 10 hour, ten plus hours a day here, but then you have to go to these shows and mm-hmm. sell this stuff that you've made. Yeah, you know, and, and the truth of the matter is, I that's probably my least favorite thing about this whole deal. I mean, it's it's a it's a thing I look at. It's a necessary evil. Mm-hmm. I mean, for me to be able to be back there in that shop doing what I want to do, you know, making stuff, um, I got to go sell it. And, you know, and then, I mean, I've, I've got it to where now, you know, there's a lot of shops and a lot of shops I work for 
that they never really had much inventory. You know, just like, of course, y'all don't see anything because it's all in the, but, well, you can see there's a rack of belts in the office and everything, but, you know, I probably have a thousand belts made up, or mm -hmm. close to it, maybe not a thousand, but I'm, I'm within Brock's distance of, of, of a thousand. And the same thing, whether it be head stalls or spur straps or, you know, breast collars or whatever, you know, and that's kind of way my I'm 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 not a manufacturer. I'm not, I don't feel like I'm a manufacturing plant, but I'm a small manufacturer. And when I get in there, and it's more efficient to build, you know, a dozen than it is to build one at a time. Hmm. And so, like, if I make breast collars, and I might even have, I got an order to make this one special one. Well, I might make six others, not exactly like that. But while I'm doing it, I'm I'm using the same machinery, the same procedure. You know, whatever it is to build you know more of them and so you know and, and in today's world everybody wants instant gratification microwave society right yeah, exactly and and uh, you know <clears throat> if i was sitting there and i had a, a a board that showed all the different tool patterns i did on belts and i was at a show trying to sell belts you know i probably wouldn't take very many belt orders hmm. you know i can make you this one or this one or this one you know uh, nobody wants to order and wait but if I got a, <clears throat> a wall th full of belts you'll walk over it catches your eye you walk over there and you go through them and, and uh, you know you'll find one in there that, that you want and, and if you don't find the one tool the way you want in your size maybe this one over here that's, that'll work and so right. everybody wants instantly so in most of the small stuff we do I I have inventory in. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to a saddle, I don't, you know, or a pair of shaps. I, and the other thing is, you know, I don't have, I, we get emails sometimes. Uh, I wear a medium, the girl sent me, I wear a medium and a da da da, and I, do you have a pair of shaps that fit me? Well, for one thing, we don't have shaps made up. We measure you and make them to your measurements. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but, you know, to have, and I don't make small, medium, large. You know? <laughs> I was about to say that, yeah. And and so, you what know, is your weight right now for for on, shaps? On shaps, we're probably in the four. I, I was five, you know, four or five months. We're probably getting it down a little bit. Yeah. What uh, about saddles? Saddles about five or six months. Hmm. You know, and like I said, those are the things that you know they're just a steady, constant deal, and then. You know, the, all the other stuff is just something we try to keep the inventory filled in and those things. And mm -hmm. uh, anyway, that's that's basically what we do. I mean, uh, it's, you know, going to the shows and stuff like that. You're asking about that. I'm kind of like a farmer in that I, I grow my crop and I go to town to sell it, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, <clears throat> we're trying more and more, like I said, I'm trying to become a businessman trying trying to learn about marketing and and what have you and one of the things that i see uh and i've seen for a long time and we we keep talking about doing it and we each year we maybe make a step or two towards it but we keep trying to uh i want to get more of an internet presence and maybe improve my website we you know for a long time i didn't I didn't want a shopping cart on my website. I wanted people to call me and talk to me and me be able to give them their options and so on and so forth. And I still do on saddles and shaps. I want mm -hmm. to talk to them. And, and even people that I email back and forth, you know, and I, sometimes in Australia and I have to email, but I, li I want to talk to them on the phone. I want to make sure we're both on the same page and that when, you know, I, I've had it happen to me too, you know, you order something and you're excited about it and then it comes in and that don't look like what I ordered, you know, or what I was thinking anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, I don't want people, same thing. I, I, when I make them a pair of shaps or I make them a saddle, I want us to be on the same page and I talk to them on the phone and, and the one good thing about the website is we can be looking at the same picture at the same time mm -hmm. and pointing out different things and what have you and and that puts us on the same page where you know if i've got a shopping cart and you go down and you check the list of what you want on it and send it in well 
sometimes people have their terminology wrong on something mm. and you might be ordering something that okay you just told me you want that but you're thinking this over here so you know when i talk to them i can make sure that we're both talking about the same thing yeah and so <clears throat> uh and like i said yeah you know the selling part of this is my my least favorite deal it's it's uh i'm not a good salesman <clears throat> Uh, I'd say a lot of your stuff sells itself, though. Well, it, you know? it, I wouldn't be in business if it didn't, to be honest with you. <laughs> but uh, uh, my selling technique, I guess you'd say, is I try to educate the customer. You mm -hmm. know, I know when I go to buy something, I want to know as much about it as I possibly can find out before mm -hmm. I make a decision. And I remember one time I was looking at something, and there were two different things, and and this one had ball bearings and this one didn't and i'm i'm thinking ball bearings might be better but i want to know why you know and and so i'm back and forth trying to figure out which one i ought to get and that and i think most people are that same way you know they want to make it they want to know about it before they make a decision mm -hmm. and 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 there again that's why i try to educate them on whether it's a saddle or whatever it is or they're getting you know i'm telling them the ins and outs and the downfalls and what have you of it and uh, that way, I think they feel more comfortable making the decision. But and I've had, you know, they're in selling. I've had friends that are unbelievable salesmen. I mean, I've known guys that, you know, they made a living selling and they could sell anything to anybody. And they've tried to help me. And uh, you know, and they they. I remember one guy kept going. There was there's like five different steps to selling, and he went through. And I don't even remember what they are now, but. I remember the very last step was you have to ask the customer to buy. Right. And you can do that however you want to. You can say, hey, what do you think? You want to write an order up on that? Or, or would you want to take that one right there with you? Mm -hmm. You know, whatever you're comfortable saying, but you got to ask that customer to buy. Well, my normal sale is when the customer says to me, and I've explained it to them and everything, they say, uh, well, what do I have to do to order one? <laughs> <laughs> so that's how bad a salesman I am. And uh, yeah, anyway. Or, well, I think it, people realize after they talk to you, even just for thirty seconds, you're a salt of the earth kind of guy. You make a quality product. Like I said, it sells itself. So mm -hmm. that takes that the sales pressure off of you. Yeah. But. Yeah. Like I said, I I, I hope they see that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joey, let's get into some some rapid fire stuff. Um, I'll just ask these things back to back. That's four or five questions, and you can just give a one to two word answer. All right. Okay. Favorite western. Um, I'm just trying to think. Probably Shane. Okay, good one. You said you like to read. What is your favorite book? I really don't have time to read that much. I, I like books, and that's why I really like the pod, or the, not the podcast, but the audible listening to books. Because I, I, I can't, I can't tell you when the last time I read a book because I don't ever have time to read a book. To be honest with you. <laughs> okay, what about podcasts? We'll go with that. Favorite podcast you've listened to? Oh, like I said, I, I the one about uh, how I built that is, is one. There's. Uh, I listened to the other guy, the guy that did, did the dirty jobs. Uh, he's got one. I think it's called "The Way I Heard It," and it's 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 pretty cute, pretty interesting deal. It's <laughs> not very long, but it's it's pretty interesting. Um, like I said, I, a lot of the stuff that I I like is is history, you know, uh -huh. and I, I like a lot of a lot of World War II history. I like American history, you know. Uh, the stockyards down there in Fort Worth, tremendous amount of history, you know, and that was one thing as a kid that I, I look back upon now that I, I really enjoyed was there were still a lot of them old codgers around when I was, you know, was, I was 16, 17 years old down there. And they would tell stories about stuff that, you know, about the stockyards, about the Mule Alley and, you know different things and i mean there was all kinds of 
goings on. I mean, there mm-hmm. was there was open gambling in the stockyards in Fort Worth back in the 30s and 40s. Mm-hmm. And matter of fact, Benny Binion uh, was a big part of that in Fort Worth, and that's one reason Benny Binion he was run out of the state of Texas, and that's when he went to Vegas and started the Horseshoe Club. But he was down there in the stockyards and. Like where Letty's, where Letty's is right now, uh, right across the street, some of them old boot makers that worked up there at Letty's, oh, yeah, you used to go over there. You could play blackjack or roulette. I mean, I'm talking about across the street from Letty's. Yeah, I mean, there's you some know, cool stories exchange. to hear. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, actually where Letty's is, it was, it was a brothel. The, <laughs> the, it was called the Seagraves Hotel. Yeah. And uh, upstairs where the saddle shop is, that was... Uh, it was a cat house, and there were several on on that. I mean, all down there, you know, on on exchange and all around in the stockyards, a lot of cat houses. And uh, anyway, and, I mean, that was the whole deal. I mean, either a beer joint or or a, a cat house or whatever. And that's what year was that? Huh? Do you know the year? Oh, when all year? that was going on? What year? I don't know when the when they finally got rid rid of the prostitution. Uh, I know if you go to Pendleton, it's it's a lot like Fort Worth Stockyards. I mean, that right? Uh, they had I don't know how many, you know, brothels in town and within a six block radius and <clears throat> and what have you. And I think it was like 1956 when they finally shut down the last one that they knew of. Mm. You know, but uh, uh, you know, exchange that way. But that that was Cowtown. That's where the cowboys came into town. They you know drove the cattle in. Back in the day, <coughs> they sold their cattle in the stockyards. Uh, they got paid. They went to the beer joints, the cat houses, and and went and bought them a new pair of boots and a saddle. You know, yeah. That's what what everything was down there. Uh, you know, it it was. Uh, you know, and they had gambling. So I mean, it was all all for the cowboy coming to town. Is what yeah. it was. That's cool. Really cool. Well, I'll throw this one in there. Um, since we're on the stockyards, what's your favorite restaurant to eat at in the stockyards? In the stockyards? Uh, you know, there used to be one down there called uh, Theo's Saddle and Sirloin. And uh, it, it's, it's now uh, Risky's, I think. But it, was, it belonged to the Yardinoff. <clears throat> Yardinoff sisters, they were old maids, and uh, they were in their 80s. And Theo's had like a, it was a mot- hotel or whatever above, which I think it may have been a cat house too. But anyway, Theo's, Theo Yardinoff was their father. These were two two old maids that were, <coughs> when I was in my 20s, they were like in their 80s. And... Uh, Cajun had a shop down there. The guy I worked for, and he he uh, leased the building from the Yardinoff sisters. Mm. But and like I said, it, that was that was a good good place. There was I mean, Cattlemen's back in at one time was really good. Um, they got a bunch of them down there now. I mean, the Star Cafe is good. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ate there T- yesterday. Yeah, Joe T. Garcia's is good. Um, do you have a must eat though every time you go down there? <coughs> I don't go down there very often. Uh, the what is it? Uh, Tim Loves has has a good steakhouse down there. Yeah. Um, usually, I mean, now when we go to Fort Worth, we're usually somewhere right around the Coliseum more so than mm. the stockyard. I, I think I was in the stockyards maybe a year ago now, but. Don't get down there too often. I got you. Um, last question, and we ask everybody that comes on the show this. Um, I'm going to ask you to de- of your definition of cowboy, what a cowboy is. And, and I think most people think it's just somebody who may chew tobacco and wear a cowboy hat. But in, in your mind, how would you define cowboy? Oh, I think uh, a cowboy, for the most part... Uh, even if he, I mean, in today's world, the guy that's still what I would consider a cowboy, he has something to do with cattle, uh, horses, uh, and probably the biggest thing is is he tries to live by the code of the West. You know, 
and uh, tries to be like the, you know, what I grew up watching the the Hollywood cowboys, you know, the Roy Rogers and and uh, Hopalong Casting and stuff like that, you know, mm-hmm. you know, being the good guy, and mm-hmm. that's, that's that's what I think of. So, good answer. Well, Joey, thanks again. Very grateful for your time today. Um, where can folks check your your um, inventory out? JoeyJemison.com. Mm-hmm. And I know you have an Instagram page. No, yeah. it's actually, I think it's Joey Dash Jemison. Okay. Yeah. You know, Joey Dash Jemison.com. Yeah. Where else can, can these guys uh, find you? What shows make you? There's Facebook. Do? I think there's Instagram. Mm-hmm. I'm. I'm not all into that, so I don't really know that much about yeah, it. Yeah, you have an Instagram. <laughs> I've seen it. It's very, it's, it's very yeah, good. Yeah, I, I trust your word on that. <laughs> what about shows that you may have coming up that you're going to be at? Uh, we're going to be at the Patriot, I think, this next week. And then, we're like I said, what we're trying to do is, is like I said, get more Internet presence so mm-hmm. I don't have to go to shows because, you know, that's the hard part for us to go to shows is – it gets it takes me out of this shop and, mm-hmm. and and like i said some of the days like the fraternity and stuff like that i've got i've got a girl that watches the booth during the week so i can stay in the shop and then i just go friday saturday and sunday but if that if that show was 100 miles from here i couldn't go to it because i couldn't be gone you know that much yeah. uh we're gonna be at the nrbc in Katy in April, I think we're going to be at the uh, um, Run for a Million mm. in Vegas, and I think it's uh, end of July, first of August, or something like that. Um, and then we'll be at Snafflebit and Snafflebit Fraternity, uh, and we're going to try to do the Raining Fraternity and the Cutting Fraternity again this year. That's pretty much it. We're we're I'm. I'll probably have a presence at the super stakes and the summer cutting, but I'm not really going to have a full fledged booth at either one of those. They're, they're, okay. I've got too many other things going on that I, I can't, I can't be there. So gotcha. Well, thank you again. I know I've learned quite a bit today, and um, I just appreciate your time. Well, it's like I tell everybody, just a, a little fiction, in fact, from Joey's Almanac. <laughs>